In December of 2009, the United Nations had called all its member states to an international conference to reach an agreement on greenhouse gas emission levels and climate change. As Kiribati is on the front line of those most affected, a special side event was organized. A contribution by the Australian government assisted in our being able to present the case for our country. Fellow citizens of this planet, from the Benino, greetings from our people of Kiribati. Climate change is no doubt the greatest moral challenge of the 21st century. It calls into question the credibility of our international systems and our ability to deal with this. Our uniqueness as human beings with responsibility and compassion for one another is being challenged. A short presentation brought the audience up to date with the background to the Kiribati reality and the need for urgent action. We are here to share our voices, our vulnerabilities. To understand our vulnerability, let's first look at the nature of an atoll. On average, an atoll is two to three meters above sea level. Being only two to three hundred meters wide means a golfer could easily drive a ball from one coast to the other. When we speak of extreme weather conditions, we're not just talking about king tides and frightening wave action. Long periods of drought can have a very direct effect on a community's health and welfare. But it's the issue of fresh water which is most important. The most fragile part of the atoll structure is the freshwater lens beneath the surface. Any sea level rise causes upward pressure to be put on the lens. It becomes thinner and may become salinated or salty. A similar occurrence happens in times of drought. In situations of overpopulation, this freshwater lens is very vulnerable to human-induced pollution and contamination. As you can see up there, Kiribati the has the highest infant mortality rate in the Pacific. Nearly 11 out of every 1,000 young Kiribati children die from diarrheal-related conditions. How many more children would die? And most of these cases is because of contamination of water, the water that we are feeding our children at the moment. So, what is Kiribati doing about these very serious issues? Under the Kiribati Adaptation Project, um, we have developed a, a national water resource policy and implementation plan, and the groundwater assessment is being piloted at the moment. We are trying to address uh, the impact of climate change on coastal areas where we can build it's better designed uh, sea walls where we need them the most. Okay, what I'm going to present is the outcome of some work that I've been privileged to uh, work in cannabis over the last uh, three years, um, which has been a participatory process working at looking at the risk assessment on South Carolina. We'll look at one area in the centre of the atoll. Currently, more than 10,000 people live here. Information was gathered from contour maps and the working group's findings, together with research from overseas scientific institutions. These are the areas in blue which are predicted to be permanently lost from a, a high springtime by 2030. And what we can do is run the time slice forward, 2050, and what's beginning to come in here are areas in, in the middle of the atoll which we think would become, start to become swampy ground and the impact on the freshwater lens will already be considerable. Flipping to 2017, when of course the impacts really start to kick in, and again to 2100. So you can see this is permanent, uh, permanent inundation, permanent land loss. We did a village by village uh, risk assessment. The very dark colour in the middle is extreme levels of risk. The uh, Yellow colour is medium level of risk and the green is low levels of risk. This is the levels um, predicted for the contours for a low emission scenario. 
If you then look at the difference between a high scenario going back to a low scenario, um, even though 60 centimetres might not seem a lot of difference in the sea level rise scenarios, it makes a really, really big difference in Kittimus. This projection at the eastern end of the atoll shows that while we may still have some land to stand on, the fresh water lands will have been destroyed many years earlier. So how do we survive this climate crisis and all the impacts that it's, it has and it's going to have on our country and most importantly on our people? We will continue to fight for deep emission cuts. We do not want to lose our homeland. We want to continue to live in Kiribati. Our brothers and sisters in other low-lying island countries, they want to continue to live in their homelands. And if we don't get support to allow our people to continue to live where we are, then we will have to look elsewhere. But the underlying point that we want to share with you is we do not want to be environmental refugees. We know how painful it is for those people affected and also those communities on the receiving end. How painful it is to deal with this uh, refugee issue. So the relocation policy of our government, it involves the upskilling of our people to international labor standards to allow them to fill labor gaps in countries where those gaps exist. Now we do not want to go, but if we are forced to, we do not want to go as environmental refugees because we are proud people would like to relocate with merit, with on merit and with dignity. This is what we want to do. One item which is a very good song and it portrays our, our closeness to the sea. The song we will hear was written in 1978, many years before we knew anything about global warming, climate change and sea level rise. The frigate is one of our key national icons, the national bird of Kiribati. The story tells of a bird flying the ocean in search of food for its young. On her return, she finds that her homeland has disappeared beneath the waves. Yeah. 